And as you should see on your screen, this meeting is being recorded. So it can be used as a reference for a training asset later in the future. And this will be made available later on to everybody that's attended or who hasn't had a chance to see it. Everyone is on mute due to the high number of attendees. But fortunately, we have the question and answer pod there. You see that, click on it. And we'll be trying to answer questions throughout the presentation. And if there are any unanswered questions not immediately addressed, we will follow up with those at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So I'll introduce myself. I'm GSA's marshaling lead, and I'm welcoming you and you're here to receive the training as GSA's contracted marshaling site. So if you're a contracted marshaler providing telematic services on a task order, you're here for this. I, and if this, of course, will apply to you, but anybody who's on contract but may not have gotten a task order for uh, telematics and you're interested, this is also for you too. So you're very welcome to listen in. And today we're gonna to be joined by GSA's Fleet Innovation Branch. It'll be David Boss, co-presenting along with GeoTab's Associate Vice President for Field Services, Greg Foley, and GeoTab's Field Service Manager, Stephen Avery. Next, please. And we'll be covering the welcome introduction, the process and procedures for best practices for installing the telematics device. We'll talk about the T-harness and the actual hardware overview, installation steps, tools, makes, models, considerations, things that are kind of unique as you go through this experience of learning how to install these. And we'll have a closing and Q&A on the back side of it. And next. All right, so as I introduced myself earlier, I'm the marching lead and my pre predominantly, I'm involved with assisting in the statement of work, the contracts and all the overarching assistance we give to the marshaling vendors to perform marshaling services for us. And why this uh, telematics training is important to you is because it's part of your statement of work and contractors, and it's stated there, will receive training from us. And this is part of that training. Of course, we will continue to provide training and assistance throughout. We'll ensure that hardware, and we, but we need you to also ensure the hardware is installed on the appropriate vehicle. And we provide list and we'll cover that, how that uh, works for you. The GSA's telematic provider, that's Geotab in this case, will provide all the required equipment and we'll ship those devices directly to you, the contractor. So there's no wondering about how to get it. And your contract uh, GSA core will be assisting you and making sure that gets sent to you and that you're getting the right equi equipment. And then also according to the same work, you're installing those devices. This is where it gets really important to you. Telematics devices are installed in all new vehicles except those on a GSA provided exempt list. And they'll go more depth to that, but what that is is basically every new vehicle should get this except for a few exempted ones. And your contracting or your GSA representative will be able to assist you in making sure you install them on the right vehicles. And these units must be installed in operational prior to the release of the vehicle to the customers. That's a big thing. And all that is part of your statement of work and that's what you know you have to do. And if you're new to this telematics and you haven't installed them yet, uh, what we're about to do, and I'm going to introduce Dave here, Dave Boss. He's going to tell you, start talking you through how you can take this important SAL um, requirements and put them into reality and then start installing devices. Here you go, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Boss, and I'm a program analyst on the fleet innovation team at GSA. Uh, thank you so much for your time today and for your partnership and support of GSA Fleet. Uh, while Geotab will be giving direction on the physical install of telematics devices later on uh, in this presentation, I'll be walking you all through the system's use of track installs, as well as GSA's expectations of you as a contract and marshaling site performing telematics installation services. Uh, the first step for telematics installation on a GSA lease vehicle is to confirm whether or not an installation should occur or should be bypassed due to the GSA fleet leasing customers telematics waiver status. The fms to go mobile app, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, now has the ability to identify whether or not a vehicle or vehicles associated to a particular order or RPN should have a telematics device installed. To access this information, the user will need to use the load new vehicle option, enter the five digit RPN, as well as the vehicle information, uh, in this case, the tag and bin, and click submit. This will prompt the program to display one of two responses. Uh, the first, do not install any telematics devices on vehicles with this RPM. Pretty self-explanatory. The second, using the T-harness and adapters provided, please install the standard blue faceplate telematics device for vehicles on the RPM. 
The only exception to the second message is for heavy duty vehicles that do not have the standard OBD 2 port. Uh, also important to know, the key to determining the telematics installation status is the RPN. Prior to implementing this new functionality in fms to go your FMC may have provided you with an Excel cheat sheet that lists the RPN numbers to bypass. Please continue to refer back to these cheat sheets as they are considered accurate for older vehicle orders. After the vehicles on these old orders arrive, you'll be able to use fms to go exclusively to determine if the vehicle has a telematics waiver approved. Uh, moving on to processes and steps. Uh, the devices at T-Harnesses will come either five or 20 uh, to a box. Uh, image number one here is a standard five box shipment, uh, which measures 13 by nine by seven uh, inches and weighs about five pounds. Uh, using the fms to go application, log the installation using the load new vehicle screen. We will go more into detail on this step later in the presentation. Uh, additionally, ensure no dashboard warning lights are on in the vehicle while it is running and all other functions are working properly prior to installing the device. If warning lights are encountered, please follow currently established vehicle troubleshooting procedures prior to installing any telematics devices. Next, you want to locate the vehicle 16 pin OBD and remove the original equipment manufacturer OBD port. After this, plug the OEM port into the provided universal geotype T harness. The OEM port will either use a snap design or bolt it into the vehicle. Next, you want to plug the Go9 device, which is the Telemax device, into the receiving port on the T-harness. The lights on the front of the device will light up and begin to uh, initialize the process or the initialization process. Uh, turn the ignition on to complete the initialization of the device. Place one of the serial number stickers on the device itself. There are three lights on the Go device, as you can see on uh, image number six. The red light indicates the device configuration. The green light indicates cellular, cellular network connectivity, and the blue light indicates GPS network connectivity. Uh, next, you want to place the T-harness OBD port into the position uh, the OEM OBD port originally was located. Uh, you select the correct adapter and install on the T-harness OBD port to ensure uh, you want to ensure to secure the adapter to the T-harness with the provided metal clips. There's one on each side of the adapter and use the plastic tool provided to secure the clips against the adapter. Uh, next, you want to secure the T-harness and device underneath the dash tightly with zip ties. It is very critical to ensure the device is stable so the internal accelerometer and gyroscope can calibrate properly. If the device is loose, you'll be getting a lot of inaccurate data uh, in terms of braking and uh, accelerating. And lastly, you want to fix the, the corresponding Geotab serial number sticker provided inside the box inside the driver's side door frame of the vehicle where the device was installed. Uh, and moving on, I'm going to pass it on to Steve at Geotab. Thank you, everyone. This is Steve Allery, a field services manager with Geotab. Just like to cover off some things um, that were mentioned about the uh, universal 16 pin harness installation. Um, we are gonna play a short video for you that uh, kind of walks through that just so you have a visual if you haven't been exposed to it. I know many of you have, and I've actually uh, spoken with some of you um, to help you with some of the particular vehicle issues you've run into. So if you don't mind, go ahead, Kyle, play the video. Geotab's universal 16-pin T-harness is used for multiple types of OBD2 installations. There are different mounting adapters for different vehicle types, so refer to the installation insert included with the T-harness hardware to identify the correct mounting adapter for your vehicle. Place the correct adapter onto the open end of the T-harness and apply pressure until it clicks into place securely. Now, place the metal fastening clips on each side of the plate and ensure they are securely locked in using the tool provided. Now locate the diagnostic port, which is usually found under the dashboard on the driver's side. Identify the type of diagnostic port connection. It will be either a screw in or a snap in style. Remove the screws or unsnap the diagnostic port and insert the new port by 
by snapping it or screwing it into place. Now connect the male short end of the harness to the vehicle's OBD2 connector. Connect the go device to the female long end of the harness. You will hear six beeps and all three LEDs on the device will flash briefly. Turn on the ignition and the device will beep as each one of the LEDs light up. Red indicates ignition detection. Green indicates cell connection and blue indicates GPS latch. Wait for all three LEDs to come on. Then secure the device to the harness with a zip tie and zip tie the harness and go device up under the dash to a permanent location. To ensure the quality of data, the device must not move in any way under the dash. The installation is now complete. To ensure the device is communicating, go to install.geotab.com and enter the device serial number. You can go to the next slide, Kyle. Okay, so this is going to be quite redundant. Um, just going over the kit again and the multiple adapters that are made for all OEM vehicles. Uh, and as mentioned in the video, some have um, some screws hang holding them on. Uh, oftentimes, the uh, Chevy and Ford vehicles, some have snap in connectors like the more of the uh, Dodge and Ram products. Um, so that will, uh, is a good baseline for you. Uh, in the picture to the right is um, an example of a heavy duty harness. And it's a little different looking. So this would be on buses and big trucks. I know that you don't necessarily do those, but I wanted to make sure that you had uh, some exposure to that harness. And those are the different adapter styles of how they attach to heavy duty trucks. Um, so just, you know, for your reference, make sure that you know that. Uh, this, uh, most of the time, um, you, you'll have nothing but Geotab uh, hardware and harnesses in front of you. So we just want to make sure that, that we adhere to only using our products um, with these vehicles. I, I highly doubt that you'll ever have the aftermarket stuff that's out there, but there are some uh, aftermarket adapters and some things, uh, harnesses that, that uh, are available on the web. But uh, it's highly unlikely that you'll have you'll have exposure to those. So just always make sure that you utilize our our geotab uh, made products when you're doing your installations. Um, next slide, please. All right. So let's talk about the device orientation. This is very key when you're installing um, into the dash of the vehicle. As you can see on the left hand side of the picture, there the the bottom of the device is actually where the antenna is located. And you can see that it's either under the go uh, label on the left hand side or uh, the picture um, next to it, looking into the face of the device where it would plug into the harness. With, you can notice that's a beveled connection. It's on the bottom side, which should be the label side with the ge uh, geotab serial number on it. And the pictures off to the right are very important because you want to make sure that you secure, as mentioned previously, secure the device um, to a wire harness or a bracket, as indicated, uh, facing the antenna, which would be the geotab uh, serial number label, uh, away from the metal or away from the harness. It can face towards the center of the vehicle, it can kind of face the driver, it can face straight up. Um, up is better. The, the dashes are made of plastic, so the uh, GPS signal can uh, transmit through that plastic. Um, we just don't want to have interference based on um, it being up against some metal because it can inhibit the signal and the accuracy of the device. Now, keep in mind, this does have a cell phone in the device, uh, just like the one you carry in your pocket. It uses a SIM card as, as anything else. So it transmits by the cell, but it does receive that GPS signal. So it is important to, when mounting to be conscientious of where you mount that and how you mount it. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna reiterate the securing of the device as well. Um, it does have an accelerometer in there that is used for safety reporting, like hard acceleration, hard braking. Uh, harsh cornering with the gyroscope that was mentioned. 
So the orientation of the device doesn't uh, necessarily matter uh, if it's you know standing up, sideways, flat, facing upward. Um, the gyroscope will learn how it's mounted and, and consider that zero. So if um, there was some harsh cornering or something like that in a, in a driving habit, then it would uh, kick off a safety report. The accelerometer part of it, definitely uh, make sure that the device is mounted solid so it's basically becomes one with the vehicle. You wanna make sure that it's hard mounted. You see an example there of a couple zip ties holding it on. Um, something else that's critical is the zip tying of the device to the harness uh, in the middle picture there, uh, just to make sure that that doesn't come undone from the device for some odd reason through vibrations. Um, and the actual OBD connector, the factory connector in the left-hand picture shows a, a zip tie going around our harness to the factory OBD connector. That's highly important too, just to make sure that nothing ever wiggles loose or comes undone and uh, causes one of these to not operate um, in case of you know, a critical situation where we need some data uh, from an accident, reconstruction, or anything that you know might be uh, safety related. Um, and for the safety of the, the folks that are driving these vehicles as well. So just uh, take a good look at those pictures. And like they said, this, this video will be available um, or this presentation will be available for uh, future viewing by you folks. Um, so just wanna make sure that you, uh, I can't stress that enough. Just please, zip ties are cheap. Make sure that you tie this in securely. The wiring harnesses as well. Uh, we don't ever want a liability situation where, where one of these might fall out of the dash, get entangled in somebody's feet and cause an accident. And, um, you know, zip, most zip ties are maybe two cents a piece. So please just uh, use zip ties. It's the cheapest insurance you can find to make sure that everybody is safe and that uh, our product works the way it's designed. Next slide. So the recommended, um, some recommended tools. Um, I know this has come up and I think there may have been a few pictures shot out in the past uh, that kind of prompted some of these things for this uh, presentation, but uh, definitely some panel tools to kind of wedge in between the panels to pop them free from the dash, a nut driver or a screwdriver. Sometimes you have Phillips screw heads. Sometimes you have the little bolts. Some of the bolts, most of them are either seven millimeter or nine thirty seconds pretty standard on, on, on all manufacturers, especially for the diagnostic port. Some of the newer Fords have that bigger um, gateway module that uh, for their diagnostic port, it's a big, big black piece of plastic. So you have to take that off. That is eight millimeter nuts on those. Um, so just keep that in mind. Maybe take a few notes on the sizes, uh, a screwdriver or a screwdriver, however you want to, you know, take your cars apart. Um, it's quicker with a screw gun, of course, but and nut drivers as well and the bits that go with a, a universal screwdriver kit. Flashlight and headlamp always helps. Gotta see, it's, um, I don't know if you're doing these installs inside a shop or outside. We recommend outside because of the GPS capability of locking to the satellites, We're unrestricted. And um, sometimes cell coverage can be a concern uh, if you're in the building. So, um, but the flashlight and headlamp will always definitely give you a hands-free operation, especially the headlamp, that's my personal choice. Um, and to some wire cutters just to keep your zip ties trimmed up so you don't have those little tags hanging out everywhere once you install it and keep everything neat. Next slide. Here's an example of some of the uh, panel tools I mentioned. Uh, you can get these at most auto parts stores or order them online. The, um, and this is just some pictures of my, of my truck. There's a short video that you'll see here uh, on panel removal. Go ahead, next slide. So enjoy these couple short videos. It just gives you a quick insight on um, some tips and, and taking the panels off the vehicles. Uh, uh, I know I don't expect you guys to be auto mechanics, but um, you are getting uh, some familiarity with vehicles and taking interiors apart. So uh, enjoy the videos. Hi, this is... Uh... Steve Allery with Geotab Field Services team. I'm uh, looking at a 2020 Ram 1500 truck. And I just wanted to um, point out a couple things about panel removals that you uh, may encounter 
and on this particular um, vehicle, these, these panels here, uh, called a knee bolster, sometimes um, have screws holding them on. You'll have to look underneath the dash to see where they might be. If you don't see any kind of a connector, then they will just pop off, okay? Um, so don't be scared to pop, pop them off. You can use a pry tool such as this or such as this plastic one. And in this case, I can't get this panel all the way off. It has two screws. There's one there and there's one over here that hold the bottom of my panel on, in which case you need to remove it. Um, so I'll remove the two screws and then my panel comes off 100% and allows me access to install my go device. And here you can see my go device harness and my go device is up here in the, in the end panel actually. So let's see if we can pop that off real quick and uh, get this panel tool in there. This is non-marking because it's plastic against plastic. And there happens to be my go device tied in the end of my dash. So um, I hope this helps you with uh, being more comfortable taking panels apart and vehicles to install the GeoTab Go devices. If you have any questions, um, we do have installation guides available. And um, I believe GSA already has some of those uh, that they had put up to you folks to assist. And you can always call our support. Thank you. Hello. I just want to talk to you about panel removal on some vehicles that you may run into. This is a 2018 Dodge Durango and some of the connectors that you may run into. In this particular case, uh, this has the, uh, like a push pin style removal um, to take off this hush panel underneath so you can access the underside of the dash in order to put your GPS in. And then there's an end panel here that you can pop off using a panel tool such as this or this. This plastic type tends to not mark the plastic up or mar it. Uh, it is a little more challenging to get in. Well, let's go ahead and remove one of these uh, push pins, if you will. You have to get the tool under the push pin and pry slowly. And you can see here that it, it has a uh, these ridges on it that help keep it in place. And that would allow you access to the under dash in order to install the GeoTab device. I hope this helps and I hope this is clear. Um, we might be able to get this in here and pry this panel loose. There you go. Slides in, doesn't mark it up and then you can pull off this leather stripping, or you can get that loose, pull the panel out, and then that allows you some access in the end to tie up the go device. Hope this helps. Thank you very much. Oh. All right. So the installer of the telematics device should log completed installations via the FMS to go mobile app. Doing so will provide instant feedback as to whether or not the installation was successful. This can be accomplished by accessing log telematics installation and entering data in these required fields. First is installer company. There's a drop down menu. The options are GSA, marshalling and geotab installer. Next is installer name. This will auto populate with the email of the logged in FMS to go user. Device serial number. You can enter this value by scanning the barcode of the telematics device. The VIN, which is entered manually, and the odometer, which is also entered manually. Uh, there is also a field for comments, however, this is not required. Once the data above has been entered, the user will need to click submit, which will prompt one of uh, two responses. One is install successful device communicating. 
And the second is issue detected. Please ensure the device is properly connected and try logging the installation again in five minutes. If you are unable to successfully log and install, send an email to fleetsolutions at gsa.gov that includes the serial number of the device, VIN, and odometer. Uh, next slide. Uh, we just uploaded version two of the GSA Fleet Telematics Install Guide for you all to reference out in the field. This is the latest and greatest in terms of best practices for telematics installations. So if you ever have questions, the install guide version two should be the first place you look for answers. We've also included a matrix of some of the most common issues Marshallers face while installing telematics devices. If the device falls out of the T-harness port or the device moves after installation, take it out and reinstall it using the proper zip tie technique to ensure it's efficiently secured for proper readings. Failure to do so will result in inaccurate accelerometer readings. If the device isn't properly seated in the OBD2 port, no LED lights will appear lit. Reinstall the device correctly and securely. If you see no LED lights, red, green, or blue, that means there's an installation or power issue. In the case of a power issue, the cause is possibly a low battery, but could also be a faulty device or a harness. You should reinstall the device in a different vehicle and contact the fleet innovation team if the problem persists. If the red LED light is on, but the blue LED isn't, that means there's a GPS issue. Most of the time, this is caused by the vehicle having an obstructed view of the sky and as a result has poor cellular connection. Try moving the vehicle to a clear area, meaning out of the parking garage if that's the case, and reinstall the device. If the red LED light is on, but the green light is off, that means there's poor or no data coverage and the device needs to be reinstalled in a clear area. If the problem persists after a reinstall, then please contact the fleet innovation team. It is important to note that uh, while these troubleshooting steps are provided, the GSA fleet has ordered thousands of telematics units. We've had very few instances of device malfunctions. Moving on. Uh, here are some important things to remember. One, use old inventory first. This means a first in, first out basis, or you can think of it as drawing from the bottom of the pile. Geotab sends devices expecting them to be installed and functioning with a certain time frame. So by using the first in, first out method, we can prevent devices from sitting at marshalling sites for months at a time. Uh, please log the install in the FMS2Go app as close to the vehicle load date as possible, which is also found in FMS2Go. This allows the GSA and its customer agencies to better track completed installs and avoid discrepancies in records found within GSA's fleet management system. Before securing the GO device to the harness, please make sure all three LED lights on the faceplate are illuminated and solid. This reduces the likelihood of installing a faulty device in a vehicle that would later require reinstallation. Make sure the device is properly secured under the dashboard and inside the side panel. Failure to do so will result in bad accelerometer data and potentially a device failure from falling out. Lastly, make sure to place the sticker with the device serial number inside the driver door frame. This simply makes it easier to confirm whether an installation has been performed on the correct vehicles and that serial numbers correspond properly. Uh, moving on to things you should not do. Uh, do not expect to install in heavy duty vehicles. Uh, this retrofit effort is uh, currently targeting um, standard uh, vehicles in the GSA fleet. Uh, do not plug the device directly into the OBD2 OBD port. This is very important. This means the T-harness is required for all installations. The device should never be plugged into the vehicle OBD2 port directly. Uh, this next one is self-explanatory. Self -explanatory. Don't install on an exempt vehicle. Double check this before every install on the fms to go app. It will tell you whether or not the vehicle is exempt and needs a GPS or non-GPS device. Don't daisy chain harnesses together. Uh, this means there should be one harness per vehicle. Uh, do, don't forget to secure the device and wires underneath the dashboard. Uh, failure to do so can result in device failure and the need for a reinstall. Don't forget to place the serial number sticker on the door frame and the device. This is how we know which devices are in which vehicles. Uh, and do not use install.geotab.com to activate the device. There may still be guidance and instructions provided with each box that lists that website. Uh, However, do not use it. Instead, please use the FMS to go log install feature. Thank you so much for all your time today. Uh, I know some of you uh, submitted some questions and I believe they are mostly answered. 
Uh, let's see. Dave or Kyle, is there anything that you guys would like to add? Or Stephen? Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay, David? Yep. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I think a lot of the Q&A is received so far. We've typed in answers. Hopefully everyone can go ahead and uh, read those. One I wanted to uh, emphasize or uh, pull up for everyone was uh, this question. And it is, let's see, I just had it here. I uh, just lost it. But um, anyway, the, the uh, question itself was about do specific devices or geotab serial numbers need to be matched to specific vehicles uh, or VINs? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, basically, you'll, as David mentioned earlier in the presentation, in an ideal setting, you'll uh, take the last or sort of the oldest devices you've received and install those on the new non-exempt vehicles arriving, uh, doing that as much as possible. Uh, but the actual serial numbers of the devices or the boxes that you've received from Geotab do not need to be uh, matched with specific vehicles arriving, uh, uh, GSA fleet vehicles arriving. And uh, if there are additional questions, looks like there's a few more coming in. Um, let me answer, let me ask this one. We have some Honeywell devices devices that do not work well, uh, so we do not have scanning abilities at this time. Uh, I believe that relates to more the hardware used uh, for your FMS to go functions. Um, and and I don't know Troy if you have some answers on that one, but we can certainly uh, get back to you on that. the The other benefit of the app is the the stuff can be typed in, uh, the data can be typed in. It does not always have to be scanned, although scanning is, is definitely a uh, preference. Um, but your GSA fleet uh, FMC might be able to help you with the actual hardware used. Uh, another question we're getting a lot is, will this recording be sent to the participants or a link provided to review the recording? And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, a link will be provided once this recording has uh, been completed and is available for review. Uh, so we'll make sure to get that out to everyone or any other sites that couldn't attend today. Um, we got some other questions about full walkthroughs of videos or, or, or um, specific sessions set up. Um, Greg, do you want to kind of address that for, for some of this kind of nuanced one-offs? We can also, there are specific questions with the marshalling set. I know your team has also assisted in setting up FaceTime calls to kind of walk through uh, specific installs um, and that that option may be available. Um, we would just have to be notified and have to uh, coordinate that with Geotab. Yeah, I'll, I'll make one comment, Dave. Um, I mean, having specific videos for specific year make model vehicles is, is difficult just from a scalability perspective, but I, I think a majority of the the questions that we've gotten from marshalling sites about how to install something is more related to re removing those dash panels and how and, and when and what tools to use, uh, which was kind of the the impetus for this presentation, at least from our or my perspective. So hopefully that helps. Uh, if if there are other specific vehicles, uh, I know Mazda 3 is, is mentioned in one of the questions. Um, there, there's not really a trick to most of these vehicles. As long as you can remove the dash panels, then it's just a matter of finding a place to secure the device inside the dash somewhere and, and being able to secure it correctly. Uh, but as Dave mentioned, if there is something that is really challenging to one of the marshalling sites, it is uh, a possibility for a member of my team to contact the marshalling site directly uh, to walk through you know what the what the issue might be, and then perhaps we can we can document that and send it out through uh, GSA. And this is Steve. I wouldn't mind making one more comment to the to the group. When it does come to these vehicles, a lot of them are very similar in how they come apart. And again, if you don't see a screw, the panel most likely pops off. If you do pop off one panel, maybe an end panel. Some of the I know the uh, Impalas, Chevy Impalas for sure. 
used to pay, take off the end panel and there might have been a screw that on the side of the knee bolster that would hold it in on the end of the dash. So just, you know, go slow, take it easy, try not to break anything, but have confidence that if you don't see a screw that the panel most likely pops off. If you see screws, remove them and go for it. You, you'll do fine. Awesome. And uh, Steve, there's another question that just came in uh, regarding sort of that GPS latch. Can you can you talk through that if there's um, maybe limited GPS coverage or, um, you know, taking the vehicles to an area to ensure sure. that connection makes place, takes yeah, place? So, so, yeah, if you're in a parking structure underground or something like that, there's a chance you may not get it. If that's the case, you won't get the blue light. It won't come on. It might blink. Um, so, Definitely. Um, I, I, I personally have been in situations in the garage where I was uh, at a customer on site working on some uh, some issues. And when I put the new unit in, it would not latch to the GPS. I had to back the car out of the garage, wait a couple minutes, the blue light came on solid, we were good to go. So yeah, if, if you get into a situation or if it's raining outside and you're doing these things in the garage, uh, and your green lights on, you got your cell coverage, go ahead and, you know, maybe just back the car out, make sure you get your blue light, then go back in and put your, put your dash, uh, put the unit in the dash and put it back together. That's common. It, it happens, especially in weather events or snow, if you're in the Northeast or North or Northeast, I guess. All right, I'm seeing a few more questions come in. Is it likely for the device to need maintenance once installed? Uh, and examples including, um, you know, diagnostic scans, uh, that type of thing. Could you uh, maybe speak again, Steve, to the T-harness and, and the sure. advantages there? Sure, so the device shouldn't need maintenance. Um, everything we do for updating the firmware on the device, it's all done over the air. Uh, with the advantage of the T-harness, um, you know how the device plugs in. If you were to put it straight on the port, then you would have to take it off to use a diagnostic tool, scan tool. Um, in this case, with the, with the, with the T-harness, it actually allows you to have that open port, looks factory when you walk up to it. it gives you a good covert install, but it also allows for you to use a scan tool while the device is in the vehicle. Um, our device is designed to recognize a scan tool presence on the network when you plug it in and it will back off and go offline while you're using your scan tool on the vehicle. And then once it uh, uh, doesn't detect the scan tool anymore, it comes back online. So there really shouldn't be any reason to have any maintenance uh, related to the device um, once it's installed. Yeah, and I'll reiterate too, the, the, the thousands of devices we have received, I mean, there's, um, once a device has been installed, I mean, and, and we get that latch and confirmation things are working, there's been very, very, very few issues of um, troubleshooting steps required beyond that. So, cool, thanks, Steve. Uh, what about a technician, another question came in, what about a technician plugging a scan tool into the port upside down? The port shape is not exactly the same. Um, and that might just have to do with the way the, the shop is plugging in the scan tool, I'd assume, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if you are in a situation where you're going to be plugging a scan tool and double check the connector before you plug in the scan tool. It does have a slight chamfer to it. It's not the best in the world. And we realize that because we've had other uh, clients uh, ask questions about that. And we are looking into that to maybe make it a little bit more comprehensive so you can't plug it in upside down. But right now, the way it is on that particular uh, port that sticks out to the customer, uh, yeah, that, that's something that we're working on. But just please, uh, the best I can tell you is just be careful when you go to plug it in, look at it first and make sure that they're both uh, facing the same way on the chamfer. Okay, great. Well, we don't have any, any more uh, outstanding questions. Um, so I guess we can end this session early, but. Uh, uh, Dave? Oh, 
Yep, sorry. Yeah. So this is Troy. Um, I, I wanted to follow back up on the uh, device, the Honeywell devices that did not work. Oh, thank you, Troy. Yeah, yep. go ahead. So I just I just double checking as I was looking over, make sure I answered this correctly. So um, in accordance with the statement of work, um, the vendors are, that are providing marshaling services are now required to provide an Android device that uh, uses the FMS to go uh, application. So they wouldn't have to rely on the Honeywell devices. If, if they have any questions about that part of the statement of work and getting an Android device, please work with your core and they can help you walk you through that and what you need to do. Perfect, thank you, Troy. Yep. Great, well, I think that concludes this session. There, there are no more questions, but again, uh, thank you all for your time today and, and the session uh, as mentioned and uh, in the beginning is, is recorded. So we'll get a link out uh, to you all to reference again uh, or to provide to additional sites that couldn't attend today. Um, and of course, uh, you know, for our marshalling sites out there, uh, you have your GSA fleet POCs, you know who those are. Um, the innovation branch can also be reached at fleet solutions at gsa.gov with specific telematics issues or questions. Um, and then, of course, we, we do have this support as evidenced today by Geotab and, and, and ensuring these installations uh, are done in accordance um, with OEM specs and with, with uh, how, how the device functions. Really appreciate everyone's time and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.